I will say that like you and I have been having these conversations for at least eight months now and I have been applying them with my own kids and I will say that I do notice my kids are a lot more verbal about the details now and it, it surprises me. I, I think you just gave a lot of information and give people <laughs> just between the now it's, pheno it's phenomenal but we should be listening to our bodies and also listening to other people compassionately. Right. Play is the best way for them to learn and it's teaching them the shades of gray. Like we live in this world where yes, like certain things are deemed appropriate or things are deemed not appropriate, but like in reality, it's just like a child experimenting and learning and feeling what feels good to them and what doesn't. Welcome back to Sensory Play Reimagined, a podcast exploring how sensory play can help unlock your child's development and well-being potential. I'm your host, Rachel Rothman. I'm a mom of three and a toy expert. I am so thrilled today to be joined by two incredible OTs. I have Rachel and Carrie here. Um, I'll let you guys briefly explain who you are, what you are, kind of your field of study, um, and then we can just dive right into all things sensory and play. Um, so again, thank you so much for being here. Carrie, if you want to go first and kind of give a, you know, a quick intro to who you are and uh, what what your what your work is. I, I am a pediatric occupational therapist. I do also work with adults. Um, I specialize in sensory integration, um, but I am in the process of becoming a relational therapist. Um, and it is probably a lifelong process. But about four years ago, I shifted my practice to a polyvagal theory, which we'll talk about, and it has just completely shifted my practice and I want to share it with the world. It's incredible. Thank you so much. Excited to dive in. And Rachel? So I'm Rachel. Um, I went to NYU and graduated with my master's in pediatric occupational therapy. I've been really lucky to meet Carrie, who has been my mentor for the past um, five, six years. Carrie really encouraged me to become an expert on a primitive reflex integration, which may or may not make its way into this conversation, but um, that sort of directed a lot of my framework framework around how I see children. Fantastic. Wow. I'm also a mom of my own children with different needs, so I see things from all different perspectives. It's really fantastic. Um, and so thrilled to have both of you and I, I joke, but it's very true. Like I basically do this podcast so that I can selfishly learn from brilliant people like the two of you. Um, and it has been such a gift imparting information on parents to just help them better understand themselves, better understand their children, help to kind of facilitate um, interactions that just feel a little bit better and maybe a little bit easier for everybody just through different lenses of understanding. Um, and I am excited to kind of hear, you know, again, from from the two of you, you obviously both have practices, you work with families, you work with kids, um, just in terms of what you have found to be the most helpful and supportive in setting families up for um, kind of an improved dynamic amongst everyone. So I'm really excited. Um, and I think like kind of like high level and while we've talked about it before, I think it's really important to just like come back to this that you mentioned, you know, sensory processing and sensory processing integration. Can we just talk for a moment? Let's like break it down. What exactly is sensory? What exactly are the senses? I think like we all know the common five, um, but maybe uh, Carrie, if you don't mind kind of diving into when you hear the word senses, what does that mean? What what should that kind of be spinning in the minds of parents? Reality. So I, <laughs> we perceive only in three-dimensional reality. Sensation is energy, it is fluid, it is physics. And I think looking at sensory from just an everyday experiential lens, we take the pressure off because we can easily divide it into two groups. And I'm very left brain, so I think I do that a lot, um, but it has really fostered a novel perspective. Um, so you have your external sensory systems that really tell you about the spatial envelope. You have your sense of hearing, you have your sense of touch, you have your sense of taste, smell, and sight. Um, and they're all super important, but they would not exist if you did not have your internal sensory systems. Um, the most important sensory system that I think everyone should try to understand if they have one big word to follow up on is the vestibular system. The vestibular system is 
how we perceive gravity. It is detected in our inner ear when we move our head. Um, it underlies our muscle tone. Muscle tone is the resting state of our muscles against gravity. It underlies our balance. It underlies our awareness of our physical midline and being grounded to this earth in reality. It underlies um, using both sides of the body together. And it is the master integrator, it connects with all of the other sensory systems. So when I think sensory, I think, all right, what's the vestibular system's role in this? Do they think they are upright when they're really horizontal on the floor? Um, so understanding that you know, we are within an active world and we should be listening to our bodies and also listening to other people compassionately. Right. And like understanding it through the lens of we are all different and that like with that can bring so much more understanding and compassion. Um, well, and I think there's such a spectrum of humanity that, you know, it's not diversity is incredible and We've placed these boundaries and expectations where if we could individualize every single thing, it would be wonderful. Right. Um, because again, we are all motivated by different things and we exploration is how we learn. Our curiosity is really what drives our development. Um, if we're not curious, we are not going to put in the effort to sustain engagement. If we're not curious, we're not going to repeat it to experience it multiple times. Um, and if we're not curious, we're not going to be little scientists performing the scientific method to really learn everything there is to know about something that motivates us. Um, so I'm clearly a fan of the scientific method. Do you, do, like, do you mind kind of like just breaking that down for people? Like you're talking about exploration and being a scientist. To you, what does that kind of look like in in regard to a child? Like, what does that mean for them to be doing as a so child? I'll give an example of how I use it in play. Mm -hmm. um, I have basically like an indoor gym and we climb and we see. Is that behind you? Do you have it is. <laughs> I'm like, I just want to dive in right now. Yes. <laughs> um, and if we're doing something new, um, I make sure that. I'm reading my children's cues to make sure that they know that they're safe. And I establish a rapport where I'm your partner. We do things together. Um, and um, everything is exploration. And they tell my friends that we are scientists. And, um, and if I have a question, so the scientific method is like a hypothesis and then a procedure and then a conclusion, um, which is actually exactly what sensory processing is. We have a perception and then some action happens and some change occurs. So while I am attempting to improve or um, increase their sensory integration skills, I am also teaching them how to increase their own sensory integration skills. Um, I was just gonna to say like, I, I think there is no amount, the way that you, I think you described it was like, play is the best way for them to learn and it's teaching them the shades of gray. Like we live in this world where yes, like certain things are deemed appropriate or things are deemed not appropriate, but like in reality, it's just like a child experimenting and learning and feeling what feels good to them and what doesn't, you know, like I almost don't like to use the words like positive and negative because it's, it's just an experience and like, and based upon your interaction with it, it might feel good. Or maybe it doesn't feel good, you know, and I, I think that that's also uh, an important element that like what feels good to one person might not feel good to the other person. And that with that, you're learning, you know, and I think to your point, you're saying like in the process of you, you're obviously like very skilled in what you do. You're pushing them. You're pushing them to to explore a little deeper, a little further with a trusted, you know, source that they know that they feel comfortable and safe with, et cetera. So that like, well, maybe that you know, a little bit more, you know. To that, you know, we talked about connection and I had mentioned that I am a relational therapist. So um, when we all day long go up and down the polyvagal ladder. Okay, I'm not going to get into the details, but basically when we are connected and we feel safe, we are in what's called social engagement. Some threat is perceived and every perception is sensory. We'll get to that. But some threat is perceived and it sends us into a survival response of fight or flight. So fight 
or flight may look like a child running away, a child getting really silly, a child, um, you know, acting out familiar activities around the gym, um, or, you know, you accidentally touch the child's arm and they kick you. And in that moment, I know that that was not intentional. I know that action was preceded by a sensory perception and resulted in dysregulation. So if threat brings us down the ladder, feeling safe brings us up. And if I respond to that unintentional action, setting a consequence for accidentally hitting me or um, setting really firm limits about expectations and you're not allowed to go over there, I am not helping that child to feel safe and connected to me or to the environment. And then I am limiting their experience and their exploration of all of the details. So prioritizing, um, we use a child-led approach. Now, child-led is not enabling. It is not imitating what they're doing. It, it, doesn't, is, mean they're, it doesn't mean they're the dictator. <laughs> and right. I, you know, it's, it always, as complex as it gets, it always comes back to validate. It is what it is. Connect. Sensory information directs um, perception or, or connection. Sensation is connection. Play is connection. Connection is responsible for all change. So we validate what is, and then we connect some sensation, maintaining the perception of safety, maintaining regulation maintaining this energetic rhythm um, and collaboratively problem solving. So what that looks like, collaboratively problem solving may just be me narrating through. I wonder if I push this fast, if it will get down the slide faster. Huh, I wonder if I hide this under here, if you're going to be able to find it without using your eyes. Um, or, you know, when something happens, like I throw a ball at the mirror their suction. Sorry, I'm fidgeting with one right now. But and it doesn't stick. I may say, hmm, do you think that was too hard or too soft? So it is talking about the details with certain kids. Some kids it's too much for words, but it is experiencing within this perception of a safe relationship while following the child's curiosity and motivation. A word from our sponsor, EduShape the original sensory company. EduShape is a 40-year-old expert in child development toys that started by working as a trusted supplier of daycares and preschools. It has since expanded to support families and special education globally. It's been featured on the Today Show, New York Times, Cosmopolitan, Good Housekeeping, and more. Their toys are rated five stars by millions of consumers. Get yours today. Rach, can you give me an example maybe of like in a session, like what would that look like for you? Like a child, like what might be something that you would engage with a child on to kind of test the waters with them? Like I, I'll give you an example with my own child and it's <laughs> actually testing the waters. Yeah. Um, so my older child does not like getting in the pool. And I know because I'm his mom and I'm very attuned to him that he does not like that sensation of water on his body. He does not like being wet. He doesn't like coming out of the pool and being cold. Um, he doesn't like needing to go and get dressed after. And so um, I was actually in the pool with Carrie the other day, and you can hear my husband getting frustrated. Like, get in the pool. It's the summer. We have a pool. You need to get in the pool. And Carrie's listening to this. We're in the middle of having the same conversation. And, you know, we started actually talking about it in the context of this episode, um, how would we like break this down? How would we get him to be curious about the pool? How could we achieve what we want to achieve with, without this being a forced, you know, interaction? Like you need to get in the pool. Um, and so how that looks like for me is thinking through all of these steps, like, look, babe, I have a, two towels out here for you. So as soon as you come out, we're going to make sure you get super warm. And I already have your clothes already laid out for you. So you don't have to go upstairs. Like, I'm already thinking through all the things that he's having anxiety about. Um, and then, you know, I know that he likes coins. He's very into collecting money now. And so we came up with the idea of like, why not put the coins in the pool and make this an exciting thing where he gets to find treasure in the pool. 
And it literally worked to a T. He spent the next hour in the pool looking for coins, having a great time. You know, and these were not all things that he was going to communicate to me. So that's just where like the compassion comes in. And like, it's a lot of work to think. And attunement. And attunement. Like, you know, your attunement. It's, it's a lot of work to have to think through all these things. And like, you know, it. And it's hard because sometimes you have two different parents and one parent, depending on how they grew up, has this perspective of, I don't need to do all this work. They have to listen to me. I'm saying to do this and this is what they need to do. And then there's the other parent that hopefully, you know, can look at things at a different perspective and try to break it down. And this applies to if your kid's being difficult and not eating dinner. Why, why are they not eating dinner? Is this because they're being defiant or is this because they have some kind of oral sensitivity as it relates to their food? And you know, asking those questions and getting to the bottom of it. So it, it's not easy and it, it takes work. And you're like, why doesn't someone do this for me? I want someone to like analyze me and already know how I'm going to feel about something and nobody's doing that. <laughs> but well, I, I, well, I we're think here for you. we're here for you, Rage. Yeah, I'll do it. But well, I think as therapists, we are trained for the just right challenge, right? Yeah. So we take classes in how to analyze any activity and break it down. Yeah. And then we're taught therapeutic use of self where our relationship is paramount. And then we use the Just Right Challenge. That is validate what is activity analysis, connect therapeutic use of self, and then collaborative problem solving is the Just Right Challenge. And you will see that this pattern repeats with all effective problem solving strategies. It is a whole two parts. Mm -hmm problem solving strategy. When you use part to whole, you are responding to the problem and saying what it is instead of saying, why is it? What came before it? Right. And so it's only half of a whole. If I'm walking and I trip over a rock and I'm bleeding and I put a bandaid on, that's great. I solved the problem of me bleeding. I did not solve the problem where someone else is going to trip over that rock or I may do it yeah. tomorrow. So really getting to the why of it and um, not taking it personally, because I think we are all wired for survival. Yeah. And, you know, I get this wrong 80% of the time with my kids. I I could talk a big game, but let me tell you, I've gotten really good I at the process. your own kids, you got the emotion. <laughs> no, we, yeah. we, we got the cognitive and the intellectual. That's right. We, then we got the, you know, yeah. And in the moment, you know, like, you can't, right now, once you're triggered, you cannot think to problem solve. So prioritizing going back to the moment at a later time mm -hmm. to extrapolate the details and problems validate what happened with your child tomorrow um connect um different things that you could have done differently and problem solve in case it happens next time yeah. i will say that like you and i've been having these conversations for at least eight months now and i have been applying them with my own kids and i will say that i do notice my kids are a lot more verbal about the details now and it, it surprises me like it, it actually surprises me the way they communicate to me what it is they need where they my voice needs to be how close i can be to them whether this is in the morning keep your distance or at night you can cuddle and give me a hug like I've gotten, I think, just through discriminating the details with them as an exercise, they have become a lot more verbal about those details and are able to identify them better. So it's it's more of this like interactive process instead of it's the long game. game. There's no instant gratification here. It, it takes exactly. time and the yeah. change is slow and steady, but also significant. I think the hardest part in this is just that like, you know, we have our own stuff going on and we come home and we're in a bad mood or we're feeling stressed about something. And then we need to be this like calm presence for our children. So it's like we need to take that 10 minutes to ourselves and ground ourselves so we can come into the room and allow them to feel all the things they're feeling and be that co-regulator, co-regulator, steady force for them. But you also have to have compassion for yourself, just like you have compassion for them. So when or if and when um, you don't co-regulate, you have to give yourself the grace and the compassion to say, well, what an awesome mistake. What a teachable moment for me to model taking accountability to my child and showing that we're all human and giving them the flexibility within the shades of gray to also make mistakes and to 
come back and problem solve later, right? Yeah. Everything that we model is what our kids hear. It's what they think of themselves. So if we're constantly telling them, stop doing that, don't say that, why did you do that? They're going to be asking themselves the same questions. Yeah. yeah. I, think- but I was just saying, no, no, when you guys were saying it, like, I've become so much more aware of my own triggers through like my own study and practice and, you know, trying to evolve and, and, you know, educate myself. And like, I'll literally tap out. There's like one or two things as a parent, like I know I cannot regulate myself for, like I cannot be in that state of calm that I know I need to be, to be able to like adequately co-regulate with my child that I just tap out. I hope to get to that place. I'm working on getting to that place. I'm getting better there, but like, I'm not there now and it's not, I'm, if I don't, and like, let's say I am the only parent or I am the only caregiver president and I have to, like you said, Carrie, it's coming back, it's repairing, it's talking about it, it's saying, I'm um, like, I literally, my my husband was out of town, we had uh, an episode of something I will say was triggering for me, I did not respond in the moment the way that like, I know what have been best for my child and kind of for the situation. And we came back to it the next day, I was like, I was having a really tough time. You know, that for me is really hard and tricky. You know, like for you, it's X. And for me, it was something involving my face. I do not like my face touched. It's something that like I just can't, I cannot tolerate. I'm working on it. We're having conversations about it, all these different things. But like, I know for me, that's like, I just, it, there's something in me, it's a visceral reaction afterwards. And it kind of sets off. Retained rooting reflex. Sure. <laughs> I, well, so I'll I agree with that. Time. We'll talk about me and my my own profiling. Um, but anyway, it was just like I was here and, and we came back and we repaired it and we talked about it. But I do think like one, the regulate yourself, like you cannot be a co-regulator unless you are regulated and making sure that you're able to be, you know, Rachel, you're using the term of just like being calm, kind of being that presence that is grounded, is calm. is able, And I, I have been, I, I notice myself when I'm able to do that, how much better the situation is able to go. And I think yeah. putting yourself in the moment I, like, I know the why at this point, you know, I have been able to kind of go through the process. I understand my children a lot better now. We have had similar pool incidences, you know, and kind of like working, working through with my child, the, ooh, it seems like this is tough for you. Like what, what was kind of the most challenging part for you? And it's funny, as much as I do know my children, as much as they are able to better verbalize and communicate or display it through other things from feeling more safe, whatever it might be. Like I'm able to discern so much more information. Like I might think I know the reason. And in many cases I might, you know, I am attuned enough at this point to like understand it, but there might be a kind of a nuance to it or something that I'm able to pick up by it by, you know, kind of, I, I, I don't know if you guys have any thoughts on like, are there helpful prompts that you find and, or that you coach parents on, like in the moment of challenge, like you know, yes, there's sometimes words don't work. Like, you know, let's come back to it later. But maybe in a moment where, you know, you are coming back to it, you are reflecting on it, you validated their own emotionality. Um, are there, is there language that you have found helpful? Are there kind of approaches that you have found helpful for kind of unlocking that or, or getting a child to kind of communicate it or even visually like observing it? Is there, is there any advice or guidance for parents on that? I'll say for me, it's funny because like my husband's the stickler for bedtime. Like he wants them sleeping and in bed by this time. And I'll be like lingering in their beds and I'm, I'm always getting yelled at for this. But that is when I get the most information. When I am like, especially my younger son, I am alone in bed with him. We're I talking. Know, that's like our moment. We're telling stories and in the middle of a story or whatever it is, like I let him pick from three different things. Do you want a book? Do you want to play a card game? Or you want to hear a made up story? He'll stop me and he'll be like, someone said something really not nice to me at school today. And it really made me in a bad mood for the rest of the day. And I'm like, it just like all clicks and and he's in a safe, like regulated place where he can continue to tell me more. And then my husband's like screaming, rage, get out of there. I'm like, I'm just like, so I agree because I just I like it's very rare that I get this and I like and and both kids are different, like how they tell me stuff. But for my little one, Jackson, that time is so important. And I we do reflect back on things that happened earlier in the day. You know, can you tell me why you did that? And um, I don't know if you've read um, Brain Body Parenting. Carrie um, introduced me to that book, but she has a whole chapter on different ways to get information out of your children. And depending on their age. But one of them was, you know, and I think you have this rage, like a box of, of, you know, do- like, let's say it's a mommy cat, a daddy cat and baby cats and friends. And you, they end up telling you all this stuff just through play. Yeah, exactly. So we're back where we started. Um, 
And I think you really do. It surprises you some of the stuff that comes out and you have no clue sometimes where certain behaviors are coming from. And then all of a sudden you, it just makes sense. The whole thing just just clicks and makes sense. And you know, you gain this new understanding of your child. The next time you see the same behaviors, you you kind of wonder if something similar um, triggered them. I, was, I wanted to think it also. Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say it also, you know, we develop with it because it's the long game. We put strategies in place that we then use to encourage our children to be able to plan and predict. And your son probably knew when he was feeling that way during the day, he would have the opportunity at night to tell you that because it is your routine, right? Exactly. And that's sensory. Every single strategy is connecting sensation in order to direct an experience. Yeah. And, and, he knows that that fe- and he knows that that feels good and that feels safe for him and that that's his time that he can do it. And, you know, it, it's, it- you know, what? And, and they're both different where he tells me stuff at night, you know, orange, just like, it'll just come out of like something huge will just literally come out of nowhere. And I'm like, wait, stop for a second. Like, wait, that's why you didn't want to go back to camp. Like, it's like, yeah. Oh, sorry. I thought I told you, you know, th- that kind of thing. Right. Um, I mean, kids are just so interesting in the way that they decide what they think is important information to tell you or not, or maybe they just forget or, you know, block it out. You know, things that are traumatic for them, just like us, they probably block out and don't want to talk about it either. So, you know, I, I, I wanted to come back to you, Carrie, you touched on this like kind of briefly, but I would love to kind of dive into it more when you talked about the just right. So like, as a parent, Rachel, perfect, you know, example, you giving the example of like the swimming pool, you knew what the things were for him. You knew how you could kind of make it a better scenario for him and kind of facilitate him wanting to be in, engaging in it. And now you guys are in, you know, a different place. How do you figure out the element of like, how much am I going to support and change and implement versus obviously it depends on one gazillion factors. You know, this is an oversimplification of it, but like, what are kind of tools or thoughts that parents should be having between how much am I going to be modulating? Am I going to be changing? Am I going to be implementing? Am I going to be instructing versus how much are we doing together? And then how much is reliant on that? Like, you know, how you're obviously you're both very versed and trained in this. But as a parent, how do you know, you know, sometimes, again, Rich, you get, you're giving like the perfect scenarios of like, my husband wants to do it this way. I want to do it this way. Yeah. I know that this is going to be the right, you know, like I obviously know from years of experience and practice and all this stuff. But this is the reason why, but him being like, you know, he should just do it. He should be able to do it. I'm going to make him do it. Like, how do you figure out the mo- like that kind of the just right element of interaction or um, change? That well, I'll let Carrie speak to most of this. But what I'm going to say, as far as like the way, let's say, my husband and me see things or any household, it all comes back to what Carrie said is like expectations. Like we have these expectations, like you are 10 years old, you should not need us to help you in any way, shape or form. You get dressed in your bathing suit and you go swim. And that's just what it is. Um, and I think we put all kinds of expectations on our kids. You, you should be going to sleepaway camp, what, whatever the things are that we've decided for them. And I think that's very hard to let go of because there's so many things we're not in, like, we're not realizing about ourselves in that moment right. that, that we're internalizing and not paying attention to. Or maybe you feel like you didn't do a good enough job or it hurts your ego in some way. And now you're imposing this on your children. Mm -hmm. So there is a lot of letting go of all of that. Just just to put that out there to begin with, you really do have to let go of your ego and what your expectations are for your children for this to all be successful. But Harry, you want to And other people's expectations, you know, other people's expectations. And that's even harder to communicate, you know, because you get it from teachers, you get it from so judgment society is is the limiting factor. And I have three things about the Just Right Challenge. So I use mantras with my kids, um, and a lot of them overlap. Um, something like, you know, if I see they're getting frustrated, I'll say, I have a problem, and they say, has a solution. Or, great mistake, what did we learn? Um, but every one of my mantras is to create this cognitive flexibility. And our perceptions are either, it is what it is, monotropic, and I am so rigid and focused on it being that, comparative, extremes, um, competitive, or um, intensity, um, 
or it is sequential procedural where we really rely on, but this is the way it's supposed to go. Or experiential, where we actually are really perceiving it through all of our senses and integrating the visual with the postural, with the auditory. And you'll see that we all perceive rigidly sometimes, monotropically, comparatively sometimes, procedurally sometimes, and experientially sometimes. So being able to look at someone else's actions with Compassion for where they are perceptually helps you to understand their actions. And then it also helps you to deduce the details of their perceptions. And when someone shows you, there's another way. When someone models or someone, this is co-regulation. I picture it as me just keeping my heart rate even and just being. And like in attachment, you go to the playground with a toddler and you sit on the bench and your toddler runs around and explores and then comes back to you runs around and explores and comes back to you. And they are learning all about the spatial envelope and their body and climbing and jumping because they know they're safe and you're there. Emotionally, the same thing happens. And I picture co-regulation as me just sitting on that bench and the child dysregulating away from me and then coming back to me. Dysregulating away from me and coming back to me. And my body language is consistent. I have soft eyes, a soft smile. I nod. If I'm using language, it's, I get I'm it. listening to your personality. I'm like, yeah, no, I do feel safe. And I, I make it till you make it though. Also, because yeah, yeah. <laughs> they can, they can neurocept when we're activated and we're faking it. But when you fake it, you, the action follows suit and you do develop that perception. And by you being the co-regulator who provides that just right for each of your kids when they're playing alone they're going to know what each other likes and they're going to be able to say what they like and how they want to do it and become really aware of the details yeah it's it's actually fun i have three kids who are very close in age and like they all are you know they're very good at knowing each other and how they most of the time they're able to support it and, and be able to provide it but it was funny we were playing basketball this morning and i have one again who likes big, big like big movement big strong bounces whatever and she knew when she was passing it to another one of my children like it had to be soft and gentle and she was like oh no mommy i'm gonna go walk it over because i know that she won't like it if i push it at her like she had enough awareness at six years old to know that's not how she's gonna like it i right. like that, you know and like I again, I think through the lens that you're giving, you're creating a framework that parents can understand it, but also that kids can understand it and giving them that that like the a way of looking at things that it's not right, it's not wrong, it's not good, it's not bad. It's just preference. all different. And it yeah, it just is. Like we all are different individuals who need different inputs and different things that it's like a, the just right. I also think of it like, does it feel right? Does it feel good? Does it feel like how is that feeling inside of you? And it doesn't need to feel the same for me. My my son this morning, he got really, really emotional about something and he just started to cry. And like, he first goes, I shouldn't be crying. And I was like, for me, that was a trigger. I was like, whoa, 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 we cry. You cry, you want to cry. No, but I was, you know, I maintained mine. I said, like I said, crying is just a helpful tool. I was like, that's telling you that something doesn't like, I, I was like, it seems to me it's telling you it doesn't feel right, that that feels really hard, that that feels really challenging, that that's making you sad. Like, you know, whatever it was. And I'm like, and then I gave, you know, again, talking about modeling, I was giving an example of a time I was crying and and all these different things. But to teach them that your emotions are just a tool, they're giving you information and it's letting you know, like your body, that didn't feel right. That didn't feel good. That felt really upsetting to you. Like, um, and that's okay. And now you know that information. And now what can we do? What can we, you know, like, there are a lot of people who don't, feel that. So you acting as co-regular is great, but there are also so many strategies. So when your kids are playing, you can put on music that is 60 beats per minute because that is the human heart rate at rest. That is a slow breathing rate. And literally using sound, we it's a frequency and we can entrain our internal frequencies. So any music between 60 and 80 beats per minute is All right where you tap and just go on youtube go on spotify type in 60 beats per minute whatever so there is actually my favorite is a 60 beat per minute drum loop we use drums because drums are low frequency and low frequency is vibration that could actually be felt in your tactile system too this is why music with a lot of bass makes you want to dance 
And this is why high frequency sounds tell you about the spatial envelope, right? You know that someone's calling your name from behind you, or there's a siren coming from that direction and not that direction. It's because we experience reality through all of our senses. You are here and this is what's going on around you. Our developing children don't have the sensory integration experiences in order to feel safe in a very dynamic world. So we can structure the spatial envelope with things like music, our active co-regulation. You can dim the lighting. You can use aromatherapy and a diffuser. You, forethought and creating the environment to um, your child's preferences, even if you have multiple different children. It is trial and error. Did it, error. Did it work? Didn't it work? The difference is when our kids are using trial and error, they get stuck in it and they don't learn from it and strategize. And they need us to be like, hold on, that didn't work. You can try to flip that puzzle piece, but it flips another way. How else does it flip? A lot of times they can't figure it out, so you show them, and then they learn that detail, right? So it is this parts to whole, hold apart, parts to whole, hold apart, all day long, maintaining regulation. And you're using sensation, all sensation is frequency, in order to entrain rhythms and connection. So I just want to give an example, like a real life example, and Carrie and I spoke about this as well, but... So one of my children is a, he's a sensory seeker, but it's not always cut and dry, right? Because <laughs> he's some sensory seeking, some sensory avoiding. Like Harry, I also have a sensory gym in my house slash playroom. And I was getting frustrated even as an OT because every time I would take him down there to go play, he would get wildly dysregulated and it would always end with me getting hit in the head with something whether it's a stuffed animal or a ball or a Nerf, so something. And the, the the play never ended well. And we both would leave the play and would be more distant than when we started. Um, I mean, I can say what we talked about, but how would you navigate something like that, Carrie? How do you see this? And how would you make sure that um, our play is successful? So I would validate, connect, and problem solve. I would validate what is I'm really excited to go play downstairs with you. I remember last time it didn't end well. So what can we do to make sure that we keep our body just right? And what is just right down there? Talking about it and envisioning it and demonstrating it and role-playing it is experiencing it sensory, right? So just saying, don't get crazy, is not going to help him. Yeah. But having him experience it, hmm, what happens if I say, ooga booga, clasp your hands and take a deep breath and hold it, and then blow it out. So you have something silly or funny that connects you both in the moment. So you're not reprimanding and redirecting constantly. You are reminding and connecting in order to get in sync again. Um, I would also lose the nerf stuff. If you know that it always ends with you getting hit in the head with something, get rid of anything that could hit you in the head. Um, you know, I have a lot of kids who explore the whole space and they follow a circuit from thing to thing to thing. And I just sit back and I look at the big picture. And it's always interesting because it's always unique to the child and the day. But you will see sometimes they approach, 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 approach because they cannot add that sequential step to engage and complete. So I will follow this child's um, circuit around the gym and just add one thing for them to do. I set really clear um, limits around, you're allowed to dump out all those toys, but once three buckets are dumped out, I'm going to clean one up. You put one piece away and they make it an achievable challenge. And I don't let there be any failure because that is going to activate a fight or flight response, right? So as soon as you read your son's cues and he's activating, dip the lights. Um, don't put out so many toys, put on regulating music. You know, not only is 60 beats per minute great. Um, I have had so much success. I got bone conduction headphones from Amazon, um, that I let my kids make a playlist and listen to because they sit on your cheekbones 
and its vibration. When you stick your fingers in your ears, it actually gets louder because you're hearing it through your tactile system. And so you are getting an intense sensory input that you usually only get when you don't stop talking or crashing into things. So you're replacing that. Um, you're also providing novelty that feels good. Um, and you could also, um, on YouTube, find music, any songs. There is a great soft rock playlist with like Led Zeppelin and Pink Floyd tuned to 432 hertz, which is the frequency of the earth. And it is grounding. Every strategy, whether you are using music or you are using an organizer or a calendar on the wall, engages the senses in order to entrain connection, right? Um, I also think that we have to not have such high expectations of ourselves. Like you go downstairs and you want to spend time with your son and it's supposed to be fun. Even if you set everything up, it could still go south really easily right? You need an exit plan. You can have the secret word and he doesn't do it, right? Your exit plan is a boundary. Sensation is boundaries. Sensations limit the bounds of my perception. So whether I'm sitting a, a child in a chair with, you know, a bottom that their feet are stable or it has arms so they know where they are side to side, I am telling them what is expected through what they're feeling, right? So before you go downstairs, you're going to set those boundaries and you're going to say, oh, I have the small room set up with the lights dim in the ball pit. If if we have a really hard time with ooga booga, we're going to go into that room to take three deep breaths. Even if he doesn't do it with you, you're modeling it. He's going to be curious because you are staying regulated. Even when he co-regulate, but he, he has the ability to co-regulate you and activate you, which is why your intention is to stay here. Even when you activate, your intention is to come back here, right? He's loud, you're, so, you're trying to find middle ground, right? And I think I kind of carry that I was like, you know, we, we, we're gonna set these lofty goals for ourselves, but also recognizing we're human and 90% of the time, we're, you know, like it may not go exactly so, and then we can repair and going we can to. Right, exactly. And I think one giving yourself grace in that in in those in those moments, but also like it then becomes a learning opportunity for you. So like reach in, in your example, it's like, okay, we know those things aren't working. Nerf guns are, you know, they're out of here now. And, you know, now we've come up with a plan for how we're gonna exit or whatever it is. So that And that's why it's the long game. That is whole yeah. to parts deductive reason. Yeah. I think like just hearing all this too, it's like we just expect that things are just going to go smooth and work out, right? Like I was telling Carrie, we just think that our kids are supposed to play independently. Like why can't they just not be on screens and figure out a way to play independently so we could be doing whatever it is that we need to be doing. But the reality is that unless you take the time and you set things up for them and you create some structure for them and some rules for them, it's not going to happen and it's not going to happen well. Um, and play does take work. It does take planning, whether this is like a kid playing with another kid or a sib siblings playing together or you playing with your child. It, you know, a lot of the time it does take structure and planning and thought that goes into it. And I think so many kids nowadays, I'm not judging it, but they have play dates and where do they end up? Playing Nintendo, you know, play on screens together and not in reality not in three-dimensional reality in two-dimensional two reality um so not all that thought is always going into planning those play dates right like but I, it's it's rhythmic it's validate connect problem solve validate connect problem solve constantly all day and everything that you do perception action perspective perception action perspective and I, so I think it's okay to repeat something that works. And I used to think that when I would see kids for OT, I had to come up with new novel things every single time they would come because we did that last time. But the reality is when something's working- Familiarity. Yeah, when something's working and they could work on getting better at something you've already done before, there there really is no problem in doing the same activities you know, for a couple of sessions. And well, I don't, I don't want to get into all of this, but there are yeah. some children that need it exactly the same way. They are developing whole to part. So if one detail is different, it's a completely different um, experience. 
and it's object impermanence. You know, when the kids, when you have a kid who can't leave without your toy, because when they leave and they don't see the toy anymore, the toy doesn't exist, right? Or you have a child who refuses to transition to an activity, but once they're there, they can't transition out. It is the experience of reality and change. And this comes back to fluidity and shades of gray, rigidity and rhythmic flow, right? And, you know, it is for us also, whether it's like learning how to, I don't know, I don't know, learning how to do art or anything, it is a progressive process that has to also deduce the details. And I think you, when we were talking before, like you kind of perfectly encapsulated that the only constant is change. Every, you know, like the child is changing, the environment is changing, you are changing. It like the the moment in time will never be the same again. Um, and I think and the relationships are always changing. Right. You know, Activity. everything is changing. Everything is right. changing. So even if you're keeping everything constant, something has changed still. So they're not coming back at it as that exact same individual exactly. in that exact same moment. Like I have one of my children who needs the routine. Like that's how she learns and she's able to figure out each time she comes back at it, like her body, she's more aware of it. She has a better understanding of it. Um, and it, it's a different perceived activity each time, even though it's the same. Discriminated. Right. right. She's right. capable. To, but also kids tend to be really stressed and their capacity for expectations or impositions is completely threat dependent. So if the child is showing you they want to do the same thing, follow that lead. And then that's where you kind of just go in and out of their play and test the waters and have some successful connection back off, some successful connection back off. And that's where you get really good at adjusting the just right challenge while also paying attention to their state arousal, whether they are about to go into fight or flight or freeze, um, or if they can sustain social engagement. But just because they did it last time doesn't mean they could do it this time either. Our skills change. Did it right yeah. And I think, uh, again, when they kind of hit that just right and they're in that state of flow and everything's kind of working, um, you know, sure, maybe you can push it a little bit in that moment, but like they may come back the next time and they may not be in that state and they may not be able to receive it as well. And you may need to back off a little bit too, you know, and I think recognizing that moment to moment, they're a different individual, that interaction is a different interaction. I think that is so powerful and helpful and um, uh, a way that you had framed it too is like literally putting yourself in their shoes and trying to put yourself in their mindset. Like I understand, I, I think we're all attuned individuals and people who are listening to this are like likely attuned individuals also, but like really putting yourself in the position of like, how does that sound? How might that sound to them? How might that feel to them? Like you're, you're sort of, going, a lot of assumption, you know, it's, I, yeah. I am the best example. I, my nephew, um, would come over and he would cry every time and we would have so much fun eventually. But, you know, he would get here and he's yelling at the grass and he's yelling at the bug that flew by and he's yelling at the car that went by. And, you know, my um, my friend, he's my nephew, it's my friend's. But we were sitting outside and I said, and I was demonstrating, I was modeling co-regulation and she wanted to give him food and she wanted to talk. And I was like, just be. And he was like throwing tantrum after tantrum. Anywhere he was looking, he was perceiving threat. You could physically see him perceive threat, whatever his line of sight was. And he got really curious about why mom wasn't activating with him like she usually does. He came over to mom and said, boo-boo. She kissed it and he came inside. So that is the perfect example of, you know, this attachment zone of proximal development, dysregulate away, come back, dysregulate away, come back. And looking through the child's perceptions, I, th I think for some, for some, I will, I will not say for all and for myself, you know, They're but like so different, yeah. And also, like I think that sometimes it's hard for caregivers, for parents, when a child is in that state, the perception of everybody else around them, you know. And then how are, I was just having a conversation with a, a friend of mine, and. Um, you know, we we witnessed somebody having a, a child had intense dysregulation at the beach and the parent just stayed super calm, didn't care about anything else that was going on. And within minutes was really able to help like 
de-escalate a child who I'm going to tell you was out like a 20 out of 10 was, you know, th- this child could not in any way. And it was just, I'm here for you. I'm taking and your judgment. Your bailiff's judgment was what, it was, people, was, it was what a beautiful, compassionate moment. Absolutely. Um, but, you know, there were people around being like, you know, what are they doing? Why is this child still here? Why are they not out of you? And it's like, because they're experiencing reality and and being threatened. They don't feel safe when my child is escalating. Not my responsibility. I'm responsible for this perception, that action, and the yeah, you do experience that it creates. Put a boundary around it. And that's really yep. hard. Like I, I always cringe when I see people on the airplanes that are giving out little bags of candy with a little note that says, I'm so sorry in advance that my child might be flying on the plane. <laughs> And I, listen, I don't mind getting the candy part, you know, like if you yeah. like candy, but you don't need to know. You could just be like, here's, you know, like, let's all enjoy some candy. Um, but no, I agree. I think we live in a society where there are expectations um, and perceived expectations. And that if we can remind ourselves, like, that's not our responsibility. Our responsibility yeah. is for our child yeah. is, is for this person who can't, who does not have the capacity. We we in theory should and have the ability to have the capacity and we're teaching that to somebody else and it's not our job to handle those other people you know like and i actually think that's what your podcast is for honestly i think it is spreading the awareness and there's change happening we are starting to become a more compassionate society or a more divided society but there is definitely an increase on both sides and I feel like 10 years ago, if I was telling a parent to stay calm while their child activated, it was very different than if I tell them now. It's actually accepted now. Social media, podcasts, I think the word is out that we could be more flexible. We don't have to be so rigid. Again. And it's also okay to feel. It's okay for them to feel these feelings and move through those stages of their own regulation. We don't always need to react. Yeah. The not reacting is reacting in a really beautiful way. Like, because exactly. it, it sometimes takes a lot to not react. <laughs> well, not reacting is still reacting. Again, That's where the word is. It's neuroception. It is subconsciously detecting that you're safe because the safe person is here. And they feel your heart rate. They feel your breathing. Whether or not they're aware of it, you are in training their regulation. Yeah. I mean, they- Oren will literally come up to me and like, he wants to feel my pulse, to feel where, where my pulse is at. <laughs> like, I don't have to say anything. He feels threat and he comes over to me and is like, okay, I'm, I'm about it. Beautiful. How yeah. beautiful is that? And I, I agree. Like, Carrie, the intent of what we're doing is to educate people to understand themselves better. Like, I did not know myself nearly as well as I do now. And I'm continuing to learn more about myself each day. But I didn't have the framework of like, understanding. <laughs> say again? Right. It's like the rest of your life. Being responsible for someone else's self-actualization is the most self-actualizing experience. Ever. Yes, very much so. Very much. I have never, I, I continually learn so much about myself through the lens of my children and also the language that I'm giving them and the, you know, the the tools that the I'm- Details. It, yeah, very much so. And I, again, I grew up in a- We all did. I have the, no, 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 no. I have the most wonderful parents in the world. I grew up in a, in like- in a house that like really prioritized play and individuality and all these things and what a gift it was for me. But I don't think that the the science and the understanding and the research was at the point of understanding the vestibular systems, the proprioceptive systems, the interoceptive systems, and having kind of the language and the framework for everybody to do it. Like that we're giving this information and this language so that parents can better understand it. So instead of looking at it as my child is being defiant, my child is being dubious my child is being you know intentionally instead of saying this is right we say why is this and i also i want to make the point rachel when oren feels your pulse you taught him that you used a pulse ox and you had him see that when he was feeling a certain way his heart rate went up to like 130 and then you had him take deep breaths and see that that actually brought his heart rate down those experiences are things that every parent can do. They just need to know they can do it, right? It's not necessarily creativity. Those are like tangible strategies for teaching your child to connect with their feelings. Yeah, like you said with the, the whole 2D, um, the example you gave me the other day with withdrawing the puzzle, you know, the missing puzzle. Like they definitely need these these tangible things. And 
I think they're able to generalize it, which is amazing. It's so it's really fun to watch the development happen through a framework that's intentional. Yeah. Well, Carrie and Rachel, I want to thank you both so much. Um, before we go, I just wanted to ask, was there anything that we didn't like that you would be really remiss not to share? Obviously, we can dive more in at maybe another later episode. But is there anything that you feel like, I just want to share this one more thing? It's also okay. I think you were all over the place. <laughs> I, it's like if, if we can go into each of the different bites and kind of, yeah, all over I, the place. I feel like we can have 10 different episodes on each of them, you know, I just simulation and sensory yeah. integration and tools and resources and the the framework that you're using. I think that there's so much value. And I I think if if you if you heard the word neuroception for the first time today, which is very possible, I would take it a little bit deeper of a dive into that word and what that means. Because that guides so many of our actions and our children's actions throughout their entire day. That quick feeling of is this safe? Is this not safe? Do I participate in this? Do I not participate in this? Is this someone I want to be friends with or not? Um, it's just very interesting. And I think it's only come to light in recent years that this this whole detection, safety detection system exists. It is the polyvagal theory, Stephen Porges. Um, there is a lot that you can learn about it. Brain body parenting also is based on both sensory integration and polyvagal theory. Um, they work beautifully together. Um, and, you know, all the big guns are really giving the same message. But the polyvagal theory has been researched for 35 years. Um, it's just now really, I really think it's social media. And I think it is our our sociocultural impact of feeling so spread thin and the yeah. demands placed on us. And we're seeing our kids change. You know, there's so much conversation now in the health and wellness world about the vagus nerve and there's vagus nerve stimulators and doing this for vagus nerves and cold plunging for vagus nerve and all these things for your vagus nerve and the vagus nerve is is what we're talking about here and what is tied in with this whole um neuroception and polyvagal ladder vagal and vagal. co-regulation and co-regulation it, it all goes together we could do a whole episode just and on next episode in a cold plunge that we're gonna switch <laughs> uh you know i therapy you know we're just we're just gonna hop from one to the next let's hop from one thing to another we could do a whole well, uh, to that uh, point rachel finding your brand of self-care is just as important as reading your child's cues to find their brand of experiencing reality so don't forget about yourself Try yoga. Try running. Try, I don't know, just locking yourself in your room for 10 minutes when you first get home from work. Yeah. Try getting a weighted blanket. Try getting a heated weight and vibrating uh, heating pad. I actually have one and I love it. That's why I said it. A foam roller. It's sensation. And we all benefit from feeling good. And I think that you need to experiment. We need to be curious. We need to try different things. We need to see what we like and what we don't like. I do not like heat. I don't want heat on at all. I, like, no, no. Nope. And I, I'm like, bring it on. Like, make it fire. <laughs> no, but like, right. it's funny as I experience things through trying it with my children. And then like, I try to like, oh, like, and I'm like that's, that's right. Because not. it is not, we pathologize everything. And right. we're pathologizing individuality. It is incredible. Incredible, and it is also detrimental. Right. I have I have been taking this summer the opportunity to really like find things that feel good for me. And if I tell you the positive impact I have seen on how I am able to regulate myself for my children, like I I am blown away by it in such a positive way. And it what did it like? We talk self care, self, whatever you know. But like in practice, actually doing it, I see myself being a more regulated. I see my heart rate, you know, ma being able to be maintained better. I see myself having these interactions that feel like more successful for everybody just in the nature of like, because I took that that moment. It was funny. I I, I promised this was the last thought before I let you guys go. But I um, a friend of mine just had a new baby and she was like, any advice, whatever have you. And I said, before you walk in that door, you know, when you get re-greeted postpartum, you know, leaving the child now, coming back, I said, take 10 minutes, do whatever you need to at that door. Do not cross that threshold into that room, into that house, you know, and to receive that until you're ready to receive it. You know, whatever you need to shut at the door, is that checking the email? Is that doing a meditation app? 
whatever that might be, you know, really get yourself into a grounded spot before you walk in. Because probably the biggest thing when I first went back and I just had kids, I didn't take that moment for myself. And I would see myself still up here as opposed to like bringing myself to here, which would have been a far more successful and better interaction to then build upon. So um, and we can also like list in the show notes things yeah. that parents can do input to the hands and mouth is regulating. Um, you can go online and find an EFT video where you're literally tapping on the meridians to change your energy. You can do a guided meditation. You can do breath work. There is so much available for free to us that we should all be getting grounded and finding our rhythm and flow. It was my I don't. I can't, I can't. Every time you say something, it gets like, me excited by something. Very last one, I promise. My daughter actually said to my husband over the weekend, he was getting a little elevated. I won't say why. And she goes, like, she was able to enact the five, four, three, two, one. She was like, look around. Are there five? <laughs> and she was like, help me. I was like, you guys are all like, I didn't have that language. I didn't have that framework. But, you know, we're giving them the tools and they're able to utilize it themselves. And then, I mean, she even took it a step further and was able to, you know, kind of import that on someone else and, and to help. I think beyond the social, emotional, cognitive curriculums in our school, we need sensory, emotional curriculums where kids experience rather than just learning about in their cognition. Because when you experience it, you get it. Yeah. And I, you know, you had said play is the way, play is teaching the shades of gray. That is, that's the way that kids learn. It feels safe. It gives them the opportunity to stretch a little bit beyond that, which they would. Um, and then they have the opportunity to come back to you, you know. and that's self problems. Yep. Yeah, that's really beautiful. I just want to raise. Thank you. Thank you. Th again, I would go on forever, but I'll, I know, I'll be too. I'll be mindful. And please do share all of the notes and, and information afterwards. And um, thank you. And what a gift you've given parents with all of this. Um, the tools and resources that you've provided. So thank you both so much. Thank you, Rachel, for having us. Bye. Bye. For more information on sensory play activities and resources, be sure to check out the links in the show notes below. And of course, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to this channel. And you can check out our sponsor, Edgy Shapes website and Instagram page for more insightful conversations on all things toys and child development.